pray together to our Father in heaven in the name or by the authority of the resurrected Christ as we have had the great privilege of approaching the eternal throne and making our petitions known unto our Father as we have remembered our Lord's death. I'd like to thank the brethren here who participate in these worship services and who lead us in our thoughts on the Lord's table, Brother Lee and Brother Jerry and, and others. As we come together on that specific event, we are trying to focus our minds on the death of our Savior. This is not about a baseball game or a golf tournament. It's not about lunch. It's not about what you did yesterday or what you're doing tomorrow. It is focusing your mind on the death of our Savior. He suffered terribly for you and you are not deserving of it. And it is appropriate for these brethren to lead us in these thoughts so that we can focus on those things. And I appreciate our brethren here and the good job that they do on all of our acts of worship. The prayers are reverent. The song leading is, is incredible. The songs are beautiful. We've got a really good congregation here and I hope we all appreciate it. The Hebrews writer would say in chapter 8, Now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest that is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. For every priest standeth, uh, every priest is ordained to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. He would go on to say, for if he were on earth, he should not be a priest. That goes back to Hebrews 7, verses 12 through 14. If he were on earth, he should not be priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. Verse 5 is the point I'd like to make. Who serve under the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God as he was about to make the tabernacle saying. See it that thou makest all things according to the pattern that I showed to thee in the mount. We're talking about examples. We're talking about patterns. We're going to begin a series of lessons. Regarding the admonition Paul gave Timothy in 1 Timothy Chapter 4, be thou an example. As we look at this, there are going to be some implications. And we're going to go into, into quite some depth. As you see from the outline, there's a lot of references, a lot of scripture as usual. And we are going to go pretty deep into some of these things. So I hope that you are prepared for that. And I hope you'll be with us for each lesson. How important is a good example? Is a good example important? It's extremely important, isn't it? We try to teach our children this, don't we? Be careful. Be careful who your friends are. Be careful how your friends think. Isn't it interesting how it always seems to work that when you hang around certain people that think a certain way, you start thinking the same way. Jesus called us out of darkness, Colossians chapter 1. Who hath, called us, uh, who, hath, who hath called us out of the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of His love and whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. We're called out of darkness into light. We're supposed to influence others to do the same. But very often we're influenced. I don't know how many times I've told my daughter that it's perfectly right and acceptable to have friends, but you've got to be careful to influence them and not allow them to influence you. It's hard though, isn't it? We do not need to underestimate the power of influence. The power of example. I want you to notice as we introduce this that influence can have a leavening effect. <clears throat> In Matthew 13 and verse 33, Jesus would say, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven. What does he mean? Well, we understand that the kingdom of heaven can have a leavening influence. It can have an influence. It tends to spread, doesn't it? It can have a leavening influence. So we understand that good can have an influence on others. But 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we see the opposite is also true. That by the congregation in Corinth allowing a fornicator to be uh, in the worship assemblies with them and allowing him to go unrebuked, unchallenged, Patting them on the back like everything's great. Paul would say the same thing. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. 
Anybody remember back in the book of Joshua? <clears throat> the nation of Israel had been released from Egyptian captivity, from bondage there. They had uh, been brought into a land. And in Joshua chapter, uh, uh, Joshua essentially takes place after the events of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is the last month of, of Moses' life. And then Joshua is going to be Moses' replacement to bring them into the land of Canaan. And Joshua in chapter 3, they cross uh, the Jordan River and they go into that land. Well, after the destruction of Jericho in chapter 6, chapter 7 takes up with a man by the name of Achan. And Achan finds some spoil, uh, that is some treasure, uh, from, from the sacked city that God specifically said is to be taken into the treasury. It is devoted uh, for me. No man can have it. Well, Achan gets greedy and he takes it. And he hides it in his stuff. Well, Joshua leads uh, his army out against the, the, the kingdom of Ai. And they are defeated soundly. And Joshua's like, well, what's going on? And God tells him, as long as you have this among you, I will not be with you. And that's the exact same principle Paul uses in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. People think that a church that exercises discipline is unloving. I would submit to you that you do not understand what love is. We do not love people that we pat on the back and we encourage them in sin and we promote and we approve of that. If you really love them, you will tell them the truth, won't you? Mm -hmm. I am concerned for your soul. What you are doing is not right. Not because I say so, but because God has said so. Please consider that. What's wrong with that? So it's the same thing here. Good can be leavening. Good can be influential. And bad can also be influential. 1 Corinthians 5 and verse number 6. We're going to also look at the power of an approved example. So if you will, turn in your Bibles with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy 4. We'll begin in verse 6. Paul is writing to Timothy the evangelist. He would say, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Christ. Nourished up in the words of faith and good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercises profits little, but godliness is profitable unto all things. Having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. This, uh, this is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation. We, uh, for therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe these things command and teach he says let no man despise thy youth but be thou an example of the believers in word in conversation in charity in spirit in purity and in faith till i come give attendance to reading to exhortation to doctrine neglect not the gift that is in thee which was given thee by pro uh, prophecy by the laying on of the hands of the presbytery meditate upon these things give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear unto all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Okay, so that is the text, right? Verses 6 through 16 essentially. And we're primarily looking at the verse that we read just a moment ago. And that is that let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of believers in word and conversation and charity, spirit, faith, and purity. Okay? Now, <clears throat> to begin... I would like to establish the fact that we, we briefly mentioned in Bible study this morning. And that is, the Bible authorizes, the Bible obligates certain things. And it's up to us to, to properly understand those things. Okay, So in other words, if God has implied something, not having explicitly stated it, but implied it, it's up to us to understand that and to, and to act accordingly, right? Some of our brethren sometimes use necessary inference. I know what they mean, but I don't think that's as good a term as implication because necessary inference is something that God has uh, necessarily uh, bound that we infer. Well, there's a possibility that God has bound something, he's implied it, but we haven't inferred it. So I believe that implication is a better use of the term. The Bible authorizes or obligates in three ways. We're going to look at some of these. We understand that the Bible, uh, the Bible authorizes by implication. In Matthew chapter 11, why don't you turn quickly to Matthew chapter 11 and just look at the first four verses. In Matthew chapter 11, the first four verses, I want you to understand what an implication is. 
What you have here is John sends some of his disciples to Jesus to ascertain whether or not he is the Christ who would come. And if you notice that Jesus would say, Tell John the things that you see and hear. Then he goes on to list various miracles in verse 5 that he has done and is doing. Now, what is the implication there? All you got to do is tell John that someone is here by God's obvious approval, doing the things that only God could do, John 3 and verse 2, and John will have his answer. That's the concept of implication. By seeing the evidence presented, there's only one logical conclusion. You can also see in Matthew chapter 22 when the Sadducees would ask Jesus about the resurrection concerning the seven brethren and the one wife. And Jesus says, You do therefore err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God, for in the resurrection they neither marry or are given in marriage. And then He goes on to say that God is the God of the living, and He lists Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, what's the implication there? Well, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are dead and buried. But they must be alive somehow. They still exist. Because he says God is the God of the living. The implication is, therefore, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are still alive spiritually. You can see various others. Acts 15 is another example. The, uh, the so-called Jerusalem Council came together because of the problem with the Pharisees, which believed they were trying to bind aspects of the law, including circumcision. And you see the reaction given there. And you see Peter that stands up and says, Listen, I went to the Gentiles and they obeyed the gospel. And I'm telling you right now, God purified their hearts by faith and there was no circumcision involved. What is the implication? The implication is the gospel saves, not the law. There's none of that obligated. So we understand that sometimes uh, we get authority from the Bible by implication. We understand that there are other ways that the Bible authorizes also. There is an imperative or a direct statement. Go ye to all the world to preach the gospel to every creature. Is that obligated on us or not? Very plainly it is. We know he wasn't speaking directly to you or I today, but we understand who he was talking to and the purpose thereof. So we can, we can come to the reasonable conclusion that this is bound upon us today also. Well, there's one other way in which the Bible authorizes, and that is by approved example. And I think this is one of the clearest ways, For uh, if you ask me. Here's basically the premise behind it. If the early church did certain things with approval of the inspired apostles who were acting on behalf of Christ, then those things are still approved today. Right? That's a simple concept. That's the concept of an approved example. In Acts 2 and verse 42, as the church was founded on that day of Pentecost, on the first day of the week, it says that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and the breaking of bread and prayers. In other words, they worshipped together that day and they would continue to do so on the first day of the week. Acts 20 verse 7 is another example. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verses 1 and 2. Paul would tell those in Corinth when you come together on the first day of the, on the, first day of the week that you lay by in store. Now if you notice some, if you go to a website, if you're ever traveling, and you go to a website, and you go to a church's website, and they say, give online. Personally, I'm not a fan. You know why? Because God gives us a pattern in 1 Corinthians 16 that we come together in the assemblies. We, we put it there. Right? We, we give of our means there. Not necessarily paying by credit card on Thursday to get it out of the way. I think that kind of defeats the purpose. That's just my opinion. I will, I will grant that, but I don't believe anybody could show me any biblical authority for it. What do we have in 1 Corinthians 16? We've got an approved example. i got a great idea. It's a novel idea. You ready? Why don't we just do it that way? Why don't we just do it the way that we were told to do it? What about this one? Our brethren that want to pray to Jesus. God says pray to the Father. Jesus says pray to the Father. Why don't we just do it the way Jesus said to do it? It's a novel idea. I can't believe nobody thought of it before me. Why don't we just do it the way Jesus said? Oh, I love Jesus so much. I, wanna, I, wanna, I love Jesus so much. I want to do the exact opposite of what Jesus said. Then you don't love Jesus. All right, you get the point. So we understand the validity of an approved example. 
Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, that's teaching. What was that doctrine, by the way? 2 John 9 says, Whosoever transgresses and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. Do you think the apostles' doctrine was anything other than the doctrine of Christ? It was the exact same thing. Why? Because the apostles were acting by the authority, Acts 1-8, of Christ. The apostles were only teaching that which had already been bound in heaven, Matthew 16, 19. The apostles were only teaching that which the Holy Spirit was teaching them, John 14, 26 and John 16, 13. So the Lord's Supper is to be taken on the first day of the week in the assemblies. Listen to this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, four times, four times in this chapter we have this given. When you come together in one place, when you come together in the church, when you come together, when you come together. Oh, you know what we should do with the Lord's Supper just to make things convenient? We'll just stay at the house and uh, we'll watch online and I'll just get a little saltine cracker and some grape juice. And we'll just, it'll make things real easy. Well, that sounds just like Jeroboam, 1 Kings 12. Why don't you just do it the way God said to do it? Why don't you come to the assemblies and we'll engage in a worship service that involves all the activities of worship. And we'll remember our Lord's death the way he said to do it. What's wrong with that? That's an approved example. Is there an approved example of taking the Lord's Supper outside of the assembly? I'll be back there when it's over with it. I would love to hear it because I haven't found it. Is there an approved example of taking the Lord's Supper on any day other than the first day of the week? I'll be right back there and I'd love to hear it. What about this? Philippians chapter 3 beginning in verse 14. Paul says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ. Let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. And if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Isn't that what he said to those in Corinth? 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10. By the authority of Christ that you all speak the same thing. Verse 17 says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. Didn't Paul, just by inspiration right there, affirm the validity of the concept of approved examples? He says, what you've seen me do, do it. Because you know that's approved of by God, right? That's the concept. What about in John chapter 13? John 13 I have uh, spoken with folks uh, in denominations I spoke to a denominational preacher one time years back and he uh, he wanted to know why we didn't follow John 13 I'm going to read it for you beginning in verse 12 so after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again he said unto them know ye what I have done to you that's a question there's a question mark at the end that means it's an interrogative statement, right? He's asking, do you know what I've done? Now, this denominational preacher would say, well, if you claim to follow the Bible, then you should be washing feet. Well, what our denominational friend doesn't understand is the cultural uh, significance of washing feet to first century Palestine is, is very similar to our cultural uh, position of maybe being hospitable and taking someone into your home or providing something for them that they need. If you wore sandals through the desert, you'd probably get dusty feet. And it was a sign of servitude and, and, uh, and friendship and, and things of that nature and love and concern to wash someone's feet. But notice what Jesus says here. He says, do you know what I've done unto you? Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that they were pretty sure they knew he washed their feet. So what was his purpose in saying that? Do you understand the principle I have established in doing this? That's essentially what he's asking. Notice. Ye call me a master and lord, and ye say, well, for so I am. If I them, your lord and master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, listen, he's getting to the point. The servant is not greater than his lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happier ye if ye do them. Was Jesus binding the cultural tradition of washing feet or the principle of service? 
He was binding the principle of service. Now, if this was still the cultural norm, would it be okay and acceptable as someone came to your house or you're hospitable that you wash their feet? Of course. Is there anything wrong with that? No, not at all. This wasn't a religious observation. This wasn't done in a worship assembly. This is Jesus teaching them the principle of servitude. Jesus says, if I, your master, have, have made myself low enough to do this, you should also be willing to serve others. Jesus' example of servitude is a pretty good example, don't you think? What about this one? Matthew chapter 4. Do we have any good examples of dealing with adversity and sin? Matthew 4 and Luke 4, parallel context as it relates to this passage or this account. Matthew 4 and verse 4 says, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The devil has taken the Lord, and he knows he's hungry, and he's been fasting for 40 days. And the devil says, Hey, why don't you just turn this stone here into bread? Go ahead and do something like that. Jesus says, It is written. He did it once, right? Verse 7. Jesus saith unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Satan has told him to fall down, throw himself off the pinnacle of the temple, and the angels will save him. Jesus says, It is written. Verse 10. Then Jesus saith unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Satan says, fall down and worship me. If you do, it has been given, I've been given this authority, obviously by God, to give you everything you see. Jesus says it is written. Do we have a good biblical example of how to deal with sin? We reference scripture. That's where we're supposed to go. Do you think you could deal with sin? If you struggle with a sin, recurring sin over and over, and you deal with it, and you, you struggle with it every so often, and it's the one thing that really, if you would just say right now, do you struggle with anything? And it's like, man, every once in a while, I really, really struggle here. Where do you think the answer lies? Right here. We can deal with it. Remember David. Remember David when he was... Uh, on his roof, and he saw Bathsheba up there bathing on her roof. All David had to do was consider the goodness of God and all that God has blessed him with and be in the right spiritual frame of mind, and he would have kept on walking. David shouldn't have battled that adversity by, by continuing to look. He should have turned around and gone back in and, and meditated and prayed and considered God's word. We have an example of dealing with temptation. James chapter 5, what about this example? <clears throat> James would say, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waits for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience forth, until he receive the early and the latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draws nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth at the door. Take, my brethren... The prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and, and of tender, uh, tender mercy. Do we have a good example of how we deal with things? Should we be patient? He references the, the, the prophets. Anybody remember those, uh, the study we did on little known books a couple of years ago where we went through and studied every minor prophet? Do you know that some of these prophets had it pretty rough? Do you know that not only these prophets that, are, that have books named after them, but there were other prophets such as Micaiah? They had it pretty rough. When you get thrown in prison and, and you're given the bread of affliction you know, for, for a certain amount of days and you're, you're beaten and you're treated really bad, they suffered for simply doing right. James says, take them as an example. Not only those prophets, what about Job? We even hear it today, don't we? The patience of Job. We hear it over and over. Isn't it interesting that thousands of years later we hear this? Well, what was so bad about poor Job? Poor Job. Man, he suffered some adversity, didn't he? But notice his character throughout the entire ordeal. 
He maintained his integrity and he maintained God's integrity. I will not curse God even though my wife wants me to do so. He has blessed me and anything taken from me, that is totally fine. And he, he uh, also upheld his own integrity saying that, you know what, really and honestly, what you guys are saying, his friends, is his friends. Isn't it, isn't it interesting how the wisdom of men differs from the wisdom of God? You know what his friend said? Job, if you're suffering, you did something wrong. People don't suffer unless they do something wrong, Job. That's just all there is to it. That's what they were saying. Job says, I'm telling you right now, I haven't. I have been doing what I'm supposed to do. I haven't brought this upon myself. I don't understand. And God corroborates that story and confirms the integrity of Job. It's an, it's an incredible account. But as far as patience go, there's not one man in Scripture that we could find a better example. Dealing with some hardships? How would you like to lose all of your children, all of your wealth? How would you like to lose your health? How would you like to be in torment and pain every day because of bulls and sores? Job's a great example. First Peter chapter 2, what about the example of Jesus suffering righteously? Beginning in verse 19, For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it and you take it patiently, this is acceptable. For even here and too were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. He did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Oh, it's okay for Jesus to suffer wrongfully and to do so with integrity and righteousness. But I, I, I'm just not like that. That's just not me. I can't do it. I've got to retaliate. We're to follow in his steps. He suffered righteously. We can too. We have approved examples in Scripture. Did you know that we also have examples of what not to do? In Jude chapter 1, beginning of verse 4, Jude would write this, For there a certain man crept in, uh, crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and divine the, uh, denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance. Listen to what Jude says. Remember this. Though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. Jude says, Remember the example. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he reserved in everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of the great day. Jude says, remember the example of our kindred that left the nation of Egypt and were destroyed afterward. Remember the example of the angels who kept not their first estate. They were not happy with their position, therefore they fell He's not done even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Jude says not only did Sodom and Gomorrah burn physically those inhabitants are still burning spiritually and they will keep on burning forever. Notice how Jude uses examples. Good examples Bad examples. Don't do this. Remember our kindred. Remember the nation of Israel. When they left Egypt and they were destroyed afterward. Remember the angels. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah. Jesus does the same thing in Matthew 24. Remember Lot's wife. With the destruction of Jerusalem coming, get out of here. Don't turn back. Remember Lot's wife. What happened to her? One more, Second Peter chapter 2. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment and spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing the flood upon the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes and condemned them with an overthrow. Notice that Peter uses the same examples. Angels. Peter uses the flood and then Peter uses Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember what they did. Do not be like them. Making them an example to those that would after live ungodly. 
Wake up, America. Oh, no, everything's great. We've got to be inclusive. We've got to be tolerant. You don't understand how much you hate someone if you're inclusive and tolerant of sin. That doesn't mean we're ugly to them, we make fun of them, we're mean. No, not at all. But don't you mistake love for hate. If you love these people, you will not accept what they do. You will tell them the truth. Friend, I'm telling you right now, you can't do this. There are eternal consequences. Please consider. And if they call it hate speech, then I guess so be it. But they're an example to all who would live ungodly. And he delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Listen, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. And he also knows how to reserve the unjust under the day of judgment to be punished. Do we understand the concept of an approved example? Do we understand that there are some examples that we should learn the opposite from? Don't do this. Have you ever heard that? Anybody ever tell you, do as I say, not as I do? What are they saying? I'm not a good example. That's all they're saying. We've got to learn from these. Good examples, we do. Bad examples, we learn from, and we don't do those things. We'll stop right there, and we'll catch up there next week. I'd like to extend the invitation at this time to any that have never obeyed the gospel. You must hear the word of God. Romans 10, 8 is the word of faith. Believe it. John chapter 8 and verse 24, we must believe that Jesus Christ is or we will die in our sins. We can only believe in Jesus through his word. John 20 verse 31, we must repent of our sins. Acts 17, 30, repentance is a change in mind that leads to changed actions. Matthew 21, 28, 29, and we must acknowledge our faith in Christ. Romans 10, 10, and we must be baptized for the remission of sins. Acts 2, 38, why? Because the Lord said so. And we must be faithful. 1 John 1, 7 through 10, walking in harmony with his will. For those who have obeyed the gospel, are you faithful? If not, repent. God will forgive you if you meet his terms. And the terms of pardon are to acknowledge your sin to him and he will forgive you. If you need our prayers, we'll pray for you. 1 John 5, 16. We're going to sing an invitation song as we do. If any have need, please come now as we stand and sing.